Uh, my name is Ken Nowakowski. I'm the chair of the BC Labour Heritage Centre, which is the group sponsoring this event this evening. This event is taking place on the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the Kaykit First Nations peoples. The first event that we held, the first public event that we held on Solidarity on October the 8th, focused on the restraint budget and the 26 pieces of legislation that the right-wing social credit government of Bill Bennett introduced on July the 7th, 1983. A package that attacked labor, human, social, and economic rights of most British Columbians. And that gave rise to the Solidarity Movement to, that rose to oppose the budget and the legislation with massive, broadly-based protests, not only in Metro Vancouver and Victoria, but in all parts of the province. And this evening, um, we're pleased to have a, a guest here with us who has come to uh, this event. He's a special guest. Uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, to the person who, in 1983, more than any other individual, was responsible for putting together what became Operation Solidarity and the Solidarity Committee. He was the architect of what became the largest political protest in the history of British Columbia. He's Art Cuby, and he's here with us this evening. The session this evening is intended to focus on the Operation Solidarity Strike Plan and the ensuing Kelowna Accord. We hope that the panelists and those of you here use the opportunity to discuss these events and to determine what lessons we might learn from this historic experience, albeit 35 years later. Just for the record, how many people in this room today were involved in solidarity in some way or another, either attending a demonstration or protest or, or whatever. That's quite a few. How about, how many of you were involved on this day, 35 years ago, November the 8th, how many of you were on strike or walking picket lines? Oh, pretty sizable number too. Okay, interesting. We should have an interesting discussion. So Bailey Garden, who's the project manager at the BC Labour Heritage Centre, has put together an excellent 13-minute video presentation that highlights the strike, the accord, and some of the aftermath. I want to thank her and our volunteers this evening, as well as our executive director, Donna Sakuda, for helping to make this event happen. Thank you very much. So following the video, we will hear from our panel, moderated by Kendra Strauss, the director of the SFU Labour Studies Program. And this will be followed by a question period as well as a discussion period. So please, uh, let's view the video and move on from there. Thank you. I think everyone's sitting down, so I'm going to get us started. Uh, my name's Kendra Strauss. I'm the director of the Labor Studies Program at SFU. Um, I was eight years old in 1983, <laughs> and on my dad's shoulders at some of those rallies uh, in Victoria where I grew up. So it's a real pleasure to be here tonight um, to listen to our panelists reflect on and the discussion that we really hope will be uh, forthcoming after the panelists' comments about this question about lessons learned, um, and in particular, you know, lessons learned for the future, given the uncertain political times that we're in now. 
So I'm going to introduce each of our panelists um, in turn and allow them to make their comments before going on to the next. We've asked the panelists to keep to about eight minutes each, but I'm not going to be too strict with anyone. Um, but we're hoping to have lots of time for questions and discussion at the end. So I'd like to start um, by introducing Cliff Anstein, who was that um, blonde-haired, glossy-beard man in the footage <laughs> back in 1983, um, and ha is joining us today from Ontario. So um, it was on Thursday, July 7th in 1983 that Cliff was on vacation in Indiana, taking a break before undertaking his first time as the sole BCGEU chief negotiator to bargain the master agreement with the government when he called the BCGEU to see what was in the budget. And on that Monday, he touched down in Vancouver. When meetings with BCGEU leadership, at, when meeting with BCGEU leadership and later that week with other unions to form the Solidarity Committee, which morphed into Operation Solidarity. So that was summer of 1983. Over the next four months, he was consumed with strategy meetings regarding demonstrations and other actions, the things that we saw in those clips. And when the BCGEU went into negotiations in the fall, it was with the intent of being on strike for November 1st, when the walkouts were to start. So Cliff was stunned on November 13th by the news of the Accord in Kelowna, and even more stunned when he returned to the BCGEU office and saw all those labor leaders drinking champagne while BCGEU members were still on the picket line. A year later, Cliff was elected Secretary Treasurer of the BC Fed. Cliff. Th thank you, Kendra. That was a very tired Cliff Anstein in that, uh, I think we just had 72 hours pretty much going straight in those negotiations. But, uh, okay, let me get my stopwatch going here. I want to stay on time. <laughs> um, by late August 1983, it was very clear that the mass demonstrations in Victoria, 6,000 and then 20,000, in Vancouver, 35,000, 50,000, and dozens of others across the province involving thousands and thousands of workers and citizens were having no impact on the government. The labor movement then began to change its tone, beginning to state publicly that it was time to use the traditional tools of unions, as you heard Mike say, aka walking off the job and picketing. There was no plan at that time, and the Federation leadership was developed, was divided. Kramer, was, as you saw, was taking the position of the public sector unions. Jack Monroe and other private sector unions were just saying, we need a way out of this. By early September, it was also clear among public sector unions that a strategic plan could be built around our bargaining, and an expected strike as well by the BCTF, which was being forced into that situation by the Ministry of Education. Now, from what, my perspective, one of our problems was the actual demand we had. Just a tactical, strategic demand. Withdraw all 26 bills. It didn't make any sense. Some of those bills were brutal and vicious and egregious. Human rights commissions, tenants' rights, rights controls, the disabilities, uh, other things. Others were minor. They even died on, some of them even died on the order paper. The government didn't really care about them. We never got down to focus the rest of it. And again, a lot of the leaders who, who negotiate all the time, the Jack Monroes, Art Gruntmans of the world, other people in that federation, Operation Solidarity Leadership, did not apply the lessons we apply all the time in collective bargaining. Evaluate your demands based on what you need, what you can get, and where's the most support. Come up with a strategic position. That wasn't done in, the, in, in, uh, in solidarity. Now you see in Common Cause, uh, which is not shown tonight, I imagine men have gone back on, as I have on YouTube and looked at Common Cause, a gradual increase in the focus on these specific rights issues. That may be because of Laszlo's editing, but we didn't focus, I don't believe, enough on, the, on these particularly brutal and vicious areas and to try and get a settlement. Withdrawal 26 bills didn't make any sense at all, never did make sense. 
As we move through that period, the BCGEU, the BCTF, QP, HEU, and some other public sector unions worked to develop an escalating strategy of walkouts with the intent of increasing pressure on the government. But we never had the discussion there that if the government did decide to start yielding, did we have any positions to put before them? Or was it still withdraw all 26 bills? Now, most of us, uh, Larry Keane, me, a few others, we weren't part of the Federation leadership, so we couldn't make those decisions. We were just the chief negotiators who were handling the strike. There, there were not, as we, we didn't know if there were any backdoor discussions going on between people at the Federation officers with the government about what was happening, what might be possible. In the BCGU and the BCTF, we knew we had the strength and public support of our members, our 60,000 members who were going on the picket lines. And Larry and I, Larry Keane, who was president of BCTF at the time, knew from our own experience that you can negotiate with government and you can if you have the commitment and support, and we believed we had it. That's why in our negotiations, we were able to get a commitment at the table, not to consult, like in the Kelowna Accord on Bill 2, that got its significant portions of the Public Service Labor Relations Act, but that the bill itself would die on the order paper. It's also why Larry and I were able to get, address the problems of Bill 3 and get the exemptions needing, that we needed dealing with seniority layoffs and dismissals. Because we were on strike, we said to the government, this is it. I think one of the problem, and if I can use that phrase of my jaded age right now, there was a generation gap. You had a bunch of new leaders in, in the community and in the labor movement. People with a background in the women's movement, the peace movement, the environmental movement, the student movement, with different ways of working together and of doing things. We weren't afraid to take on the government. But it was more than the strike mandate from our members and being on strike, along with the BCTF, that eliminated bills two and three. It was the message both unions sent to the government. No settlement without these bills gone. Now, I'm not saying that that approach would have worked necessarily if worked with the other 24 bills, or even the most egregious, but we never tried it. It was never tried at all. And I want that disturbing closing scene at the BCGU headquarters. When I walked into that room after the bargaining committee discussed, wrapped up at the LRB, I was upset and really angry at what I saw. And like Mike Kramer said, this is not over. I told people, we still have members on the picket line. When the bargaining committee reached a settlement at the table, the entire committee voted that we were not ending the strike, we were not taking our picket lines down until we got word that there was a, a settlement that the Federation had accepted on the, on the broader issues. We were still on strike that when those people were drinking champagne that night. And they were drinking champagne, they were drinking cheap bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> so being the typical up in the air guy I usually was, I said, screw you guys, I got out of there and I went home. I felt that day when I heard the details and still feel the same way tonight, it was a lousy deal. Made by those not involved in the struggle on the picket lines who generally were not affected by the legislation. We may never have achieved our major goals, but we could have done better. There was a, there was a big problem of that whole thing, accountability and transparency. That deal wasn't negotiated in Kelowna. I was dealing with Norman Spector all weekend. He was in and out of our bargaining. He was in and out of the other bargaining. That deal was being put together. I don't know who was on the other side putting it together, but it sure as hell weren't the people who were heading up the negotiations for the, either the BCTF or the BCGU. And it wasn't the people representing the workers who were on strike. We were excluded from those discussions. And it still pisses me off. We sold the coalition out. We didn't consult with them. We just abandoned them. When that decision was made, Solidarity Coalition was just simply abandoned. And those consultations that the government promised went nowhere. So that's seven minutes. I have a minute left. This is. What you can get with the unions fuck yeah campaign. <laughs> the unions fuck yeah, right? Go to 
<laughs> Unionsya.ca. You can order toques, you can order t-shirts, you get all the information you need. You can watch the ad again that ran during the Olympics. And I highly recommend it. Unionsya.ca. Because we need more of that. More of that. That's it. I'm 15 seconds on that. <laughs> Ending on a high note and keeping to time. Perfect. So next, it's my great pleasure to introduce Patsy George, um, who was a social worker who had been employed by the provincial government since 1975, in 1983. She was one of the employees who got the pink slip in that year. And once the Solidarity Coalition was formed, Patsy was given a union leave by the BCGEU to work with the BC Federation of Labour. She was an organizer for the Solidarity Coalition and traveled to the interior and northern parts of the province to support local community groups. After the Kelowna Accord, she was assigned to other duties within the government. Patsy's been very busy since then. Before her retirement in 2001, she served as the Director of Multiculturalism and Settlement Services. She served on the review panel of the Child Welfare Legislation in BC and an order and council appointment made it possible for her to serve on the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. She's also a founding member of the Stephen Lewis Foundation, past president of the United Nations Association in Canada, the Vancouver branch, and past president of the BC Association of Social Workers. She served on many non-governmental organizations over the years and been recognized with the Order of BC, Order of Canada, and two honorary doctorate degrees as well as the Vancouver Civic <laughs> Merit Award. <laughs> Patsy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, as you heard from the introduction, I was not only a member of the union, but also a community activist associated with social workers around the <coughs> province, immigrant community, and also the women's movement and held leadership positions outside my work hours as a public servant. When John Shields and Renata Shearer, both fellow social workers, approached me and recommended me to Art QB uh, to take on the role of a staff person at the Solidarity Coalition, I considered it a special privilege. It made sense to me that I was in a position to do outreach with various community groups across the province and professional associations and bring them closer to the trade union movement as a united front to fight the July budget and the 26 bills. Even though my own job, union job, was one of the 1,400 eliminated, what mattered more to me and many others in our union was the attack on the poor, the attack on the families with children who needed extra support, health services, loss of rental services, and above all, the human rights branch. I was always concerned that the professional and the faith community didn't really feel the same way as I did about the union movement. But the July budget and the various bills were a shock to the general public, even to those who ordinarily did not come out to protest and express their objections. I also remembered how the unions and the general community, including the faith community, were able to march together with their families and neighbors for peace and against a war agenda for many years making it possible to form alliances and trust each other. The citizens of Vancouver took pride in such coalitions, walking along hand in hand, singing peace and solidarity songs. So this job at the coalition, along with various other activities we were involved in, gave us a chance to reach out to a larger community who were equally concerned about the July budget. Some of, the work, some of them were concerned about seniors, <coughs> poor families, and others were seriously affected by the government action and believed 
that they didn't have the unions to fight for them. But they believed in Art Cuby and Renata Shearer and Father Jim Roberts, who spoke about the history of the trade union movement in getting health benefits, pensions, and fighting hate and racism. They joined in droves, attended public meetings and protest rallies. They came up with ideas and volunteered to speak at events and raise the community profile of those who will suffer under the government cutbacks. We had no trouble getting leaders from the communities to serve as an advisory committee, which met regularly to guide and support the leadership and the staff of the Solidarity Coalition. <clears throat> then came the Kelowna Accord. Everyone, including the leadership at the coalition, felt betrayed. Individual leaders who were part of the coalition left with the feeling that the unions were only interested in their members and not the larger social issues. The bitterness and sadness felt at the time remains with some of us even today. But 35 years later, the challenge for those of us who want to go forward and continue to bring social change and figure out a way to build a movement with critical mass and create a new agenda is to recognize the baggage, but take every effort to move forward. Those who left us feeling bitter 35 years ago are still active in the environmental movement and women's movement, fighting the climate change issues and peace and justice issues. What's even more encouraging is to witness a new generation in leadership positions who did not experience the bitterness and not even remember what actually happened 35 years ago. The social issues which brought us together 35 years ago are still here, such as poverty, housing affordability, health-related issues, and rights of the indigenous people, they are still with us. They were encouraged by the position taken by the union leadership in promoting minimum wage increase, affordable daycare, <coughs> and such during the last election campaign. Today, the unions, are more, unions have more clout with the NDP government in power, with the premier who became politically aware and active during the period of solidarity 35 years ago. The challenge for us is to figure out how we can build a progressive social agenda, build partnerships with people in the community. Given the experience of the Solidarity Coalition, it's my belief that a coalition for social change can come about, starting new with a new agenda. Unions, academic institutions, and community leaders can use a creative process to build partnerships focusing on the future, building a progressive social agenda to tackle the issues of the day. We can rely on organizations such as CCPA to give us facts and policy formulations to begin those conversations, which would encourage collaboration and connections within the larger communities. So it is time to act. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ken Novikowski, um, who's been absolutely instrumental, obviously, in organizing our event tonight, as well as um, speaking to us this evening. In 1983, Ken was a member of the BC Teachers Federation Bargaining Division staff, whose assignment included providing support to, provincial to the Provincial Solidarity Coalition. 
Prior to that, Ken was a high school social studies and history teacher in Langley and served two years as the president of the Langley Teachers Association. Following Solidarity, Ken went on to become the president of the BCTF from 1989 to 1992 and served again on staff as directors of both the communications and bargaining divisions before becoming executive director from 2000 to 2009, after which he retired. Ken has been the chair of the BC Labour Heritage Centre since 2013. Thank you, Kendra, and good evening, everyone. I want to focus my remarks on two things in the eight minutes that I have. One is very specifically on how solidarity changed teachers and the BC Teachers Federation. The other one is to try and look at some of the lessons that we could learn, as other panelists have identified, from that solidarity experience. Art Cubie stated in the video that you saw in a recent interview, that is, it's, it's not something we did in 1983. It was not a very happy departure and, and, and end to solidarity, but we never did discuss what we learned. So maybe this evening we can, 35 years later, get, get some idea of what we did learn from that experience. So I want to start by setting the scene for you uh, where we found ourselves essentially in November of 1983. Teachers, by that time, had been dealing with education cutbacks ever since the restraint program and the compensation stabilization program were brought in by the Bennett government on February the 18th, 1982. So we had been fighting cutbacks already. We had formed a coalition called DESK. We were doing many other things that uh, were, were combating those cutbacks in terms of raising public awareness. But teachers and the rest of the public sector, as, as Cliff clearly identified, were all affected by Bill 3, what we call the firing without cause bill. Anybody could be fired at any time. You didn't need a reason to do it. And you already heard that the BCGU were out on a legal strike as of November 1st. But teachers did not, at this point in their existence, have the right to strike. In fact, as recently as, as the year before, 1982, they had, in a referendum of members, turned down asking the right, and the executive recommended that they should ask the government for the right to strike as an option to compulsory uh, arbitration so they could have one or the other if they wanted. And they said no. 60% of teachers said no, we don't want that. We're stick with our compulsory arbitration resolution mechanism. But here we are a year later, and we know the bills and the legislation that came down and the impact of all of them. And teachers voted 60% in favor of going on strike as part of the Operation Solidarity Action Plan. That's not a great vote as far as strike votes go, but for the BCTF in 1983, it would do. <laughs> so teachers and other education workers, and we should remember that it wasn't just teachers, it was, it was the, our colleagues, our non-teaching colleagues that work in our schools with us, as well as uh, college instructors and, 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 and others. Everybody in the education sector was here to go out on November 8th if the BCGU still did not have a deal by that time that included an exemption to Bill 3. So we were, the other thing that we had to deal with is, is teachers were facing injunctions against picketing that were being brought down by school boards in district after district, including Vancouver and a number of large districts in Metro and around the province. And, uh, you know, teachers, as I said, did not have a history of strikes or, or picketing. Uh, and these injunctions were very threatening uh, because, uh, because they, they, uh, teachers were aware that they were facing these when they went to work the next morning on the 8th of November. But one of the most fascinating stories to me of the whole solidarity experience was <laughs> Oh count this is my time. <laughs> 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 
You're still choked up. We were talking before the panel about Ken gets deeply moved by these re <laughs> recollections. So we're going to give him a moment to have a drink of water. Thank you. <laughs> I will not subtract this from okay. your time. Thank you. Actually, uh, phones ended up being were ringing all over Vancouver and other communities. Operation Solidarity, Solidarity Coalition, they were phoning their members. They wanted to get them out to pick at the schools be because the uh, teachers had these injunctions. Face, they were facing, they couldn't pick it. And the phone calls went way late into the night and they started very early on the morning of the 8th. And if you remember the weather, it was raining, raining, raining. Get out there and, and pick at the schools. And so when the, the, you know, the time came the following morning, every school had picket lines in Vancouver and in every other community where there were injunctions. And teachers, by and large, overwhelmingly, honored those picket lines. That was really something for teachers, believe me. So let me turn now to the, how that experience actually changed the BCTF. I've already told you that they had turned down asking for the right to strike. They didn't like the idea of striking. And now, they had just participated in a three-day, ostensibly illegal strike. Before solidarity happened, teachers did not honor picket lines. If their non-teaching co-workers were on strike, they went to work to teach. They did not do the work of CUPE members or others who were on strike, but they, they, they went to work. They crossed their picket lines and went to work. After solidarity, the BCTF adopted a policy that had all teachers honoring all picket lines, and they did ever since. So solidarity helped turn the BCTF from a milk toast union <laughs> into the activist social justice union that is today. Solidarity was a seminal historical moment for teachers and the BCTF. The Kelowna Accord remains one of the most controversial issues, obviously, in BC labor history. We've heard how that is, so I want to just add a few, my, a few of my own comments to that. Uh, the process, there, there's the process and then the result, you know. The, so the, the process, there were, there's several things wrong with the process. I wanted to identify a couple, and the most significant one has already been mentioned by the two previous panelists. People, were left out of the process who clearly should have been part of it. The Solidarity Coalition, and I'm talking about November 13th, the day when this, this deal, this accord was reached. Solidarity Coalition and Operation Solidarity Unions, not in the BC Fed, like the BCTF, and as Cliff mentioned, like the GU, were not consulted as the deal was being discussed and finalized and they should have been, they should have been involved. Negotiations, something that we frown upon in the union movement, were one-on-one. -on -one. Jack Monroe and the Premier in the Premier's home in Kelowna. And the solidarity representative that the BC Fed officers chose to go to Kelowna, remember Art QB was sick, he was on the sick bed, they chose Jack Monroe, who was a union leader in the private sector, who had no clear commitments to the goals of solidarity. All you have to do is read the first chapter of Union Jack, his autobiography released in 1988. The chapter heading is Derailing the Solidarity Express. Personally, it's very clear where he stood on solidarity. He didn't like it. And I imagine that Monroe had his reasons to feel the way he did, and there are lots of theories as to why he was chosen to be the person to go, to the, to, to go and meet with the Premier. But in the interest of solidarity, he was not a wise choice. So let's look at what the Solidarity Accord actually amounted to. First of all, it achieved the main objective of public sector unions. All now had the right to negotiate an exemption to Bill 3. This was not an insignificant result for the union movement. It was very, very significant. But then there was the token gesture of promised consultation with community groups on the legislation. It never happened. 
Sadly, Solidarity Coalition partners were the big losers in this deal. Many felt, as has been mentioned, betrayed and abandoned. And many union members also were upset with the deal. Many of those who were out on strike Many others were, 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 were also fighting for some of the social justice issues that the community organizations represented and reflected. And so that was something that, that was also important to them. And it's significant in this regard because the Kelowna Accord brought an end not only to the strike, but also to the unprecedented province-wide protest movement that had spawned that summer. It wasn't just an end to the strike, it was an end to everything. It was all over. So looking back, let's see what we can learn from that experience. Any protest movement or coalition should have a clear and mutual understanding of and commitment to what exactly the common cause is that they share. And they should have very clear and transparent decision-making processes that are inclusive, and respectful and honored. Moments and experiences like solidarity likely come around but once in a lifetime. In reflecting upon the exhilarating feelings and exciting experiences of the summer and fall of 1983 and the unfortunate aftermath of the Kelowna Accord, I still strongly believe, as Patsy just said, that all the progressive elements of our communities working together for change is still a goal worth pursuing. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Margaret Marquardt. Uh, Margaret is a priest with the Anglican Church of Canada and as part of the community involvement in Solidarity Coalition in 1983, she chaired the People's Commission for Solidarity Coalition. The commission traveled throughout the province of BC hearing the stories of concern and solutions for addressing issues of justice in the province. And this resulted in the People's Report. She was the parish, parish priest at St. Margaret St. Margaret's Cedar Cottage from 1985 to 2008, and during that time partnered with Coast Foundation uh, to build housing on the church's land along with a contemporary parish building. That seems very prescient today in many ways. She has continued with the work of justice within the Anglican di diocese, um, or diocese, um, and chaired the panel sponsored by the BCTF regarding the philosophy of public education, uh, which she's going to speak briefly about today, which is also a significant part of this, in a sense. Um, she now works with the Burnaby Neighborhood House as an outreach worker supporting vulnerable families with young children in, with a variety of concerns, and in her capacity with the Eco Justice Unit, um, of the Ang Anglican Diocese of New West. She's been involved in the founding of the Metro Vancouver Alliance, which I think we will all be familiar with the work of. Um, and she continues to engage in local issues with the membership from labor, community, religious, and academic institutions working for the common good on issues raised from listening campaigns within the institutions. Margaret. Thank you. So Ron asked me to both reflect on the experience, but also to bring it into the current, um, so I'll try to do that. Um, so faith communities were part of the uh, community sector of Solidarity Coalition. And the ones that I knew mostly, of course, were within the Christian community, from the Roman Catholic Church, from the Anglican United. There are also some Unitarians and Quakers. And also, some of you may recognize some of the names of Solidarity leaders from the religious community, Jim Roberts, Father Jim Roberts, who died a number of years ago, a Roman Catholic priest and co-chair of um, Solidarity Coalition, uh, Bishop Remy DeRue from Victoria, and Aziz Khaki, um, who's also deceased, a Muslim leader. So I was part of the Ecumenical Committee for Social Responsibility. That was our organization that was part of Solidarity Coalition. And some of those involved, again, you might know some of those names, John Kishore, 
you know, church minister who uh, later became an MLA and also part of cabinet, uh, Bob Smith, Barry Morris, Derek Evans, and Doug Graves, all United Church clergy. Uh, many others from their congregations, Barry Morley, Sheila Patterson, David Ch Dranchuk, Judy Graves, you know Judy's name from the uh, housing from Vancouver uh, before she retired. And we would have our own gatherings, the Ecumenical Committee, on the fallout of the budget and the devastation for so many. And I remember particularly um, one such event by the Ecumenical Committee. Um, I remember Jim Roberts and I both with our kind of purple Lenten stoles and a whole group of us in front of Grace McCarthy's office uh, doing a lament ceremony on Ash Wednesday. <laughs> and I think we actually even made the free press, Winnipeg Free Press, with those pictures and doing the sign of the cross. So. So why were we involved as faith community? Ron asked me to speak about it. And of course, it would be for many of the same reasons as others, as, uh, as you joined. Um, we could see the devastating consequences of the outcomes of the budget on the poor and of all of us as part of British Columbia. And we wanted to join with others of goodwill who would raise our voices together that we wanted a different kind of province than was being shown to us. And so it was a time to act. You know that there is uh, two Greek words for act. Uh, one is chronos, which is our usual linear time, and the other is kairos, which is, means a moment. Um, within the religious tradition, we might say that was even God's moment. But for us, these two came together, and they did in our coming to be part of Solidarity Coalition. I actually don't have a lot to say about the Kelowna Accord. Um, as it came to be known. Um, there were certainly the optics of seeing a bottle of scotch and behind those windows and the cameras. Um, but my feeling at the time and since is that decisions are made that don't always make a lot of sense to those who are not in the room. And my sense then and now is that there are always obstacles to overcome that we have to have a long-term view of social change and commitment is that there wouldn't be anything that would ever derail our commitment to social justice, no Kelowna Accord, nothing that um, I know later as we had the People's uh, Commission throughout the province, we heard a lot of anger about that, but my own feeling is that nothing was going to derail us continue to work for social justice. So change which is based on social justice and concrete action takes time uh, and comes from many directions. And so in the faith communities, we continue to carry on and work with others of goodwill to keep addressing the government inequalities. And so the ongoing work. So Solidarity Coalition, knowing, I think, partially, I know Ron was involved, many others, partially trying to resurrect something, um, you know, had the, uh, this was the report that it came out of, asked um, in 1984, the Solidarity Coalition Committee um, wanted to have this um, People's Commission on Social Economic Alternatives. And uh, that was asked to go throughout the province of British Columbia. And so the commission members were Jane Evans, Ray Haynes, Mel Watkins, and myself. And I was asked to chair it. And we were supported by Jim Lipkowitz and Cliff Stainsby. And as I said, the support came from the Solidarity Coalition Committee. Operation Solidarity was part of that as well as funding it. The mandate was to listen to consistent social and, and, and economic policy alternatives and to be constructive in setting these out and to publish and distribute widely, which we did with report and in a variety of ways after. We held 11 hearings in communities across the province of British Columbia over 25 days from September 14th to December 16th, 1984, with over 400 submissions. So the outcome, the people's report, and uh, in my um, comments as chair in the front of the uh, report, I said the People's Commission has listened to those who had concerns to voice and solutions to offer. And this process of listening, reflection, action will empower all of us to work together for a just, sustainable, and participatory society. So connected with this work of the, uh, was another commission sponsored by BCTF but not influenced by in our findings. And that was 2001 to 2002. And it resulted in the Charter for Public Education, those who uh, 
We're part of BCTF. This is a little version of it, but there's the big version that often you'll see in schools. Uh, David Chevnosky, who uh, was just finishing up as his term of the president of BCTF, was part of our five-person panel. And it was much in the same, it was in the same model, really, as the People's Commission of hearing from citizens around the province of British Columbia. And so the idea of the poster uh, was really uh, to try to be a little bit more artistic and try to get the, uh, the, uh, the understanding out a little bit more. And as you know, reports, they, they really only have as much as life as, wit, as, as they're used. Um, and we certainly tried to use them. So moving on to current civil society work, carrying on in the spirit of working for the common good is uh, the Metro Vancouver Alliance. And I've been involved in it since about 2007 with others from labor and community and faith and academic. And Joey Hartman, where's Joey? Can I see her waving? There she is. Uh, Joey Hartman um, and I have been uh, uh, very much part of that together. And uh, Joey has been there pretty much since the beginning as well. So how many of you have heard of Metro Vancouver Alliance? Okay. And how many of your organizations are members of MVA? So if you aren't sure if your union is a member, and if there aren't any community groups here as well, I actually have the list with me here, so you can speak to me after. Because what we're finding, we have a lot of the unions, the major unions involved, but sometimes when we talk to individual members, they do not know that their union, BCGU, et cetera, um, are actually members of Metro Vancouver Alliance. Um, MVA has uh, we had our founding in 2014. It's part of a 78-year-old industrial areas foundation. I know that sounds like an outdated name now. It means IAF, but that was the name at the beginning. It started in Chicago in the meatpacking plants, and workers there stood up for better working conditions. And many of them were also part of the Roman Catholic Church. So the early people were Roman Catholic Church and the unions. And you'll know the name, of course, of Saul Linsky. He was there at the very beginning uh, in forming it. So there's now over 65 alliances of the Industrial Areas Foundation in the United States, a 25-year-old one in London Citizens, a number of alliances that are part of the UK Citizens, Nottingham, Birmingham, Cardiff, Manchester, among them. And I was uh, able in 2014 for a month to visit in uh, Birmingham and Cardiff and London uh, and Nottingham and to visit those alliances there. We also have alliances in Germany, Australia, Hong Kong, and in Canada, Edmonton, Calgary, and ourselves. Um, so my diocese, which is the Diocese of New Westminster, stretches from Hope to um, Sunshine Coast, is one of the sponsoring organizations. So there's the big kind of organization. So it's sponsoring along with the Roman Catholic Archdiocese and the Van City Credit Union. So this civil society model of organizing is based on building relationships across the sectors of labor, religious, community, academic, and in some places, small business. It's about listening and working together on the common good, strengthening each organization that is part of it, and building relationships of trust. And the campaigns that have been held in its Vancouver Municipal Assembly, how many were there in 2014 Vancouver Municipal Assembly? Not too many. And the autumn, and, and in the Provincial Assembly, April 2017, who were there? Who was there at that? Um, so we had, um, though we had very specific asks for both the mayoralty candidates of 214 and then the two leaders of the Greens and the NDP, the two leaders who accepted our invitations in 217. Um, and the asks were very specific and they always are in the areas of housing, economic justice, public transportation, and in the provincial one in health. And we had met with the candidates beforehand. They knew exactly what we were asking of them. Would they work with us? Yes or no. If not, what would they do? So no surprises, no trying to trap them. They uh, knew exactly what we were asking them. And these asks arose in this model from listening campaigns in the member organizations, whether they're union or community or religious, academic, uh, so that, uh, the, and then we voted on those asks. And we, of course, after the Municipal Assembly, after the Provincial Assembly, have followed up with uh, meetings with the elected officials because we also commit to being part of getting that change. And actually, Mayor Robertson um, uh, credited us for helping to get the living wage over the hill in Vancouver um, 
and then also again for the contract workers who often are the ones who aren't paid anywhere near a living wage. The ongoing work of MVA is also to strengthen each organization. We do this through relational meetings and table groups about what really matters, what are the pressures in our lives. And we find that now that many of the union member organizations have time at the beginning of each meeting to have those kind of uh, rounds or those relational meetings one-to-one -one so there's deeper connections. And uh, I know Joey and then Bill Saunders before her who was involved, you know, said that people would be sitting beside another person and say, I go to that temple actually you know and they were they're members of the same uh, same union maybe bus drivers or whatever and that they didn't realize that other you know their 5,000 uh, member temple that they actually at the same temple so anyone who is here a part of organization that is nonpartisan political so that's really important about this model doesn't get any government money and wants to work for the common good, like Patsy was talking about it, would be welcome to consider becoming a member organization of Metro Vancouver Alliance. We have our lead organizer now, Tracy Maynard, who would be glad to connect with you, as would any of us. We have leadership institutes for the training and listening and power analysis and how we do our work. And I'd be glad, as I said, to uh, let you know whether your organization is a member and also hand out the web address. We have uh, actually a leadership institute coming next Saturday, the 17th. So I do think particularly at this time of growing divisiveness among sectors of society where there is that tendency to blame and disparage those who hold different views, uh, that this model of work for the common good does stretch us to listen to the other so that we can understand and we can build relationships and work together for a just society. So thank you. Our final speaker tonight is Rod McElborough. Um, as labor reporter for the Vancouver province in the days when there were labor reporters, <laughs> Rod had a ringside view of Operation Solidarity from its very beginning to the dramatic days of November when the province came so tantalizingly close to its first all-out general strike. He's continued to write about it ever since, including a retrospective sponsored by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives a few months later, a 25th anniversary look back for the Globe and Mail, and of course his recently published uh, History of the BC Labour Movement on the line. Uh, and Rod writes, even after the passage of all these years and all the many words he has written, he still believes his instant analysis of the Kelowna Accord for the province that night stands up. Bill Bennett budged, but he did so on his own terms. Rod. I don't know, maybe I should just read out that column. It's, <laughs> yeah, there you it, it's pretty good. <laughs> You've been reading my remarks, incidentally. Anyway, it, it does, 35 years, it all seems so long ago. Where did the time go? How long ago was it, as Kendra mentioned? Newspapers still had labor reporters. Even the Vancouver province, and even after the province went tabloid, I was that labor reporter. So for those incredible four months in the summer of 83 and into the fall, I had that ringside seat for the incredible saga of Operation Solidarity, which, in case you've forgotten, brought this province to the brink of an all-out general strike for the first time. Uh, there's not going to be much in terms of lessons learned. I'm a reporter, of course, and just an observer. So this will be kind of an impressionistic, unless I'm in the bar late at night, this will be more impressionistic than any, anything else, but I really look forward to the discussions. The week Operation Solidarity launched its action plan with the euphoric, surprisingly strong walkout by the teachers, right through to the bizarre, unsatisfying conclusion on the darkened front porch of Bill Bennett's home in Kelowna was as intense, intense as anything I've covered in my 40 plus years as a journalist. For all you kids out there, there must be one or two who weren't around at the time, can you imagine an entire province holding its collective breath as the clock ticks late into Sunday night, wondering whether the general strike would escalate in a few hours with a shutdown of the ferry system or whether it was off. And everything hinging on some kind of discussions that were going on between union leader Jack Monroe 
and the premier of the province behind Bill Bennett's living room drapes. Saw a great picture of that in the, those the assembly, that assembly assembled video. Uh, someone really needs to write a play about this. Hmm. It's just too bizarre. I didn't go to Kelowna, luckily, I think. I'd spent much of the final few days camped out at the labor board, along with scores of other reporters, slews of cameras and microphones, and the worst coffee machine there ever was. We were there while the BCGU and the government negotiated around the clock to hammer out a settlement before the next stage of Operation Solidarity's general strike. At the same time, secret negotiations had been going on between the government and Operation Solidarity's new emissaries, Jack Monroe and Mike Kramer, who wore a path up the Labour Board's back stairs. They were trying to get the government to address its stripping of human rights, tenant right, tenants' rights, and other social matters that had been crippled by the government's massive restraint package. Those were the issues that drove the non-union arm of Operation Solidarity, the Solidarity Coalition, and which had been an integral part of the protest movement from day one. But the coalition was frozen out of those hush-hush talks. Art Cuby, uh, who was not there because, as you've heard, he'd been felled by exhaustion and pneumonia at this critical moment and was home in bed, frustrated, I'm sure. I was out at BCGEU headquarters in Burnaby that night as the union and other BC Fed leaders celebrated its non-concession agreement with champagne, or whatever it was, it certainly people talked about as if, as if it was champagne and reacted to it as if it were champagne, and a lot of the whooping up that went along with it. With social issues still on the table and members of the coalition fearing correctly they would be forgotten, it was not an ennobling time. I will never forget David Cadman of the coalition telling me bitterly, how can they celebrate when they're selling out human rights? There's really never been a time like it before or since. And uh, much of it was dramatic and even cinematic. So I'm going to call my assessment of those dramatic events the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not going to deal with the ugly. I will leave that to your own, inf <laughs> your own imagination. But I am going to deal with the good and the bad. And in order to end on a positive note, as rare as that is for me, first, the bad. I don't think anyone can seriously dispute that the Kelowna Accord did virtually nothing to address the deep concerns of the Solidarity Coalition and all those community activists and citizens who protested so vigorously the stripping of so many rights on so many fronts by the Bill Bennett government. Yes, the blood and guts and the money and the organization of Operation Solidarity came from the trade union movement. They were in the forefront, and understandably so. The government's notorious bills two and three were a direct assault on trade union rights, rights that, had not, that not even Wacky Bennett, Bill's father, had dared to attempt to usurp. But the heart and soul of Operation Solidarity, what gave it so much credibility that drew in thousands and thousands of people, many of whom had never protested anything before in their lives, was the large, broad-based grouping of community and social activists under the umbrella of the Solidarity Coalition. This was Art Cuby's masterstroke, to weld these disparate groups into common cause with the trade union movement. Such an alliance was unprecedented. At every protest rally, the demand was the same. Withdraw all 26 bills, not just bills two and three. Unions were seen to be fighting, not just for their own members, but on behalf of all members of society. And believe me, that gave, it, gave them a lot of credibility. In mid-October, that 60,000 strong, amazing protest march through the downtown streets of Vancouver was largely, though not entirely, the work of the coalition. This was their people, their turn. But when Operation Solidarity's general strike action plan began on November 8th with those 50,000 teachers hitting the bricks, everything changed. Labour took over. The coalition, which had been its strong partner for the previous four months, was sidelined. Union leaders would decide 
whether there was enough to call off the general strike. While well, Mike Kramer publicly blustered about the ante going up once the teachers walked out and all 26 bills being back on the table, the private reality was much different. By Friday, a general package had been worked out. Consultation on human rights, tenants' rights, and other social issues, money saved by the teachers' strike, would remain in the education, <clears throat> would remain in the education system, a few other odds and ends, and exemptions to Bill 3. Not much, but okay, in some ways. Something. Then Operation Solidarity made a fatal error. Instead of a joint announcement with the government, they decided they didn't trust Bill Bennett and wanted him to publicly confirm the agreement. That sent Jack Monroe to Kelowna. When they got there, they found Bennett wasn't interested in negotiating anything. He could sense Labour wanted more... Sorry. He could sense Labour wanted out of this more than he did. The previous, <clears throat> excuse me again, the previous commitments were still there, but Bennett refused to put anything in writing, nor would he even mention them. The general strike was off, and no one knew why, beyond the vague statements by Monroe and Bennett. The largest protest in Canadian history ended, as T.S. TS Eliot might have put it, not with a bang, but a whimper. It was a crushing conclusion, the scars of which have yet to disappear 35 years later. Okay, quickly, now to the good. And there was good, although if you have to explain that something is a victory, you know it's an uphill struggle. It wasn't obvious. But an Operation Solidarity was undoubtedly a trade union victory, although overshadowed by the hollowness and anger over the Kelowna Accord, both of the extreme anti-union bills, two and three, were beaten off, beaten back, they died. To force a premier as hard-nosed as Bill Bennett to backtrack on legislation he vowed would never be changed was a momentous achievement, no matter how you look at it. Ken has talked about the positives from the teacher's walkout. Those five days in bitter weather on an illegal strike started the BCTF on the road to becoming one of BC's strongest unions. And finally, to continue this upbeat legacy, thousands and thousands of British Columbians can look back at, with pride at being part of a people's movement that comes around only once, if ever, in anyone's lifetime. And that's not something to be sneezed at. The trouble was the Kelowna Accord was such a disaster that all this positive stuff got forgotten, overshadowed. No one felt that it was a victory, except maybe those people drinking champagne down at the BCGU headquarters. All of which leaves us to ponder the question. People have mentioned uh, that there wasn't a plan, there wasn't a bottom line. Nobody really knew what would settle the dispute. It, it, you know, in so many ways, it, it was not well thought out. And that does leave us, for those who felt that the strike should have continued, it leaves us to seriously ponder the question, what would have happened if Operation Solidarity had called Bill Bennett's bluff and carried on with its action plan? Ferry workers, transit workers, municipal employees, and finally hospital and healthcare workers, all out on the, on the street. We will never know, but it remains one of the great tantalizing what-ifs of BC history. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gene McGuckin. I'm a retired paper worker. I was president of a local and a paper recycling mill a couple of miles, a couple of uh, kilometers from here. I think if we're going to do uh, a question which uh, seems to be the supposed to be the center of this of how we assess uh, lessons that we learned, then I think we have to start off by identifying what exactly it was that took place there. Nobody here has talked about class. The Operation Solidarity was uh, a reaction to an attack by one class, the uh, financial and ruling class, again, an employer's class, against the uh, working class. And it wasn't just against the organized working class, it was against the entire working class. 
The uh, social services that everybody seems to be talking about as though they're sort of like nice things that we like and we were uh, willing to be in a coalition with them because um, we're, we're more humane or we're generous or whatever. Those are part of our wages. Social services are, is a social wage for working people. And they were attacked right across the board. And it wasn't the first time. We remember in uh, 1976, there was, uh, well, it was already mentioned here that in 1982, there was the wage and price controls, but there was national wage and price controls in 1976, right? And there was a, a, a day of uh, national action against that. This was also happening in Europe. This is a historical period, okay? So I, I, everybody think about class. The second thing that was happening was bureaucracy. The trade union movement had at that time it's gelled into a situation where there was a hardened leadership of bureaucrats who had two primary uh, mandates in their existence. One was to preserve the bureaucracy, and the second was to reproduce it, to recruit people to make it happen at a, uh, in, as time went on, right? So younger militants, and this happened to me, uh, were approached and said, you know, well, you're, you're pretty good, right? But you, you tend to criticize a lot and stuff. Why don't you come and work for us? And we'll show you how to do it, right? So the bureaucracy didn't like these uh, rank and file organizations and much less uh, the social organizations telling them what to do, right? I was in a meeting in 1987, which Cliff will remember, uh, that year because there was another major uh, struggle of the trade union movement against attacks by the government in bills 19 and 20 where the trade union movement didn't even try to form a, an alliance with uh, other groups in society because the other groups in society felt so sold out from 1983 that they wouldn't do it. But I was in a meeting of all the presidents of the uh, Canadian Paper Workers Union where Ken Giorgetti came and talked to us, and one of the th lessons he said that he learned from 1983 is we will never again in the labor movement be in a position where somebody outside the labor movement tells us to go on strike. And we said, really, Ken? That's what you got out of 1983? Okay, so bureaucracy. And the third, third uh, thing is that um, the, the history goes on. Like, we also keep on saying, you know, this was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. 1987 was another major struggle, right? 2003 and 2004, well, actually 2003 to 2005 was a major thing, right? The ferry workers went out on strike. Were legislated back to work, they defied. Members of the uh, leadership of the trade union movement went and negotiated a settlement behind their backs. 2004, the uh, hospital workers went on strike. They were legislated back, they defied, and there was a huge response by other people in this province, including non-union people, because they recognized that that was for them too, the healthcare se sector, right? The trade union leadership went and, with, with some complicity of the hospital workers' leadership, sold them out, told us that we were on the verge, in, you know, right after May Day in 2004, of, of having a general strike. And, and it had already started in some places on the island and up in the interior. In 2000 and, and okay, the I, next, okay, yeah, the last, the I just want to give I other people, seven minutes. yeah, next, I just want to give other people, we've got several other hands up, so wrap, wrap up your comments so that we can 2005, the teachers went on strike, were legislated back and defied, and again, there was a sellout. So I would ask you to look at what was happening. This wasn't just like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Okay. Uh, we've got a comment, um, woman had her hand up here, and I saw a hand up at the front. So maybe we'll take three sets of comments in total and then give the panel a chance to respond. Okay, four. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I was lucky, if you can use the word, um, to be in the legislature in the gallery on the afternoon of July 7th. I was on vacation in Victoria, and it was really amazing. Um, the speaker called for adjournment and it was unusual, at, given the timing, and nobody had it figured out. It was a huge surprise to everybody. Then they came back in. I can't remember the length of the adjournment. They came back in and just dropped them, one, two, three, four, five, just like that. The media was scrambling. I knew most of them, because I worked with Ken at the time. 
And they were asking me who, they were coming into the gallery and saying, okay, did you see where so-and-so went? And they were literally scrambling because they could not figure out what the heck was going on. And so if you want to give credit to the Socrates, my God, it was, it was really amazing to watch the whole thing unfold. I think we had a hand over here and then the gentleman just in front there as well. Where? Yeah, there and there. <coughs> My name's Jess Sokomore. I was uh, uh, the head of KMO at the time and also uh, the vice president of the Confederation of Canadian Unions. We were not affiliated to the BC Fed at that time. We had about 20,000 members in BC. None of us were directly affected by the legislation, none of our members. But through the efforts of Art Kuby and the Lower Mainland Coalition and all the other groups, we were determined to put our necks on the line to fight to end the injustice of the legislation that was proposed. So we were deeply involved. We had several people at the various meetings throughout the province uh, that were uh, really active in it. I had communication with Art Kuby all throughout that period of time, and I uh, echoed the points before that there would have been no solidarity movement without Art Kuby. But he gave, <laughs> and I speak as one, as I say, I was not affiliated to the Fed, and had a few run-ins with Arthur and <laughs> other people, as any of you old enough may know that. But the thing is, you always give credit where it's due. And he had a remarkable ability to bring people together. And they made, and we made, a commitment to all these social activists throughout the province. Now, I could go on and talk for a long, long while, but I'll just make this a couple <laughs> of points here. That it was the biggest betrayal that I have ever seen in my lifetime of working people that Jack Monroe did. But it was no surprise to anybody that knew Jack. I drank a few bottles with Jack. And you know, he was a bloody business union. When the brother there was talking about the leadership in the labor movement, you can't condemn everybody in the labor movement because there was a hell of a lot of good guys in the labor movement. Amen. Put their necks on the line and were prepared to do that. But the problem is, Arthur shouldn't have got sick. <laughs> So in one way, it's his fault. <laughs> but on the other hand, the fact is, sending a business unionist up there to deal one-on-one, -on -one, as I was quoted in that uh, short uh, film you had there, whenever you send a business unionist into the lion's den like that, one-on-one, -on -one, nothing good comes out of it. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Jeff Keithley. I was a uh, national rep with KMO at the time. I was um, the CCU's appointee to the Solidarity Coalition. But I was also at the founding of the Lower Mainland Budget Coalition. I think uh, Bill was there, Kim might have been there, Fred Wilson was there. At George called, George Hewson called a meeting. We had our first meeting five days after the budget came down. Um, we called a public meeting and we could not get everybody into the Fisherman's Hall. There were hundreds of people outside. Twelve of us were elected to a steering committee to come up with a plan of action, which we did. And that was the plan to march on BC Place. So we, and this was to be co-sponsored by the B, uh, Lower Mainland Budget Coalition and the BC Federation of Labor. We'd had those conversations. We were meeting in the Fish Hall, twelve of us, and somebody from the Federation phoned George, and he had to leave the room, and he came back in and said, the Federation's pulling out. They're not going to join in. At this point, we had 12 pieces of paper hand-drawn by myself as the proposal for the rally. So we had a discussion, well, what do you think? So we came up with the idea. So said, George, you get back on the phone, and you tell the Fed, We've spent 20, all of our money spending 20,000 leaflets. We don't have any more money. We're going to distribute them. 
And you are going to be left explaining why you pulled out when you previously agreed. So George got on the phone, phoned the Federation, oh God, God, we're back in, we're back in. And then we printed 20,000 leaflets. <laughs> now I want to jump forward to the eve of the general strike. And it was that time um, that my friendship with Art Kuby came about, uh, and it's remained ever since. Everybody, uh, most people thought, well, the strategy was, let's put the teachers out first, because they're not a member of the Federation, they don't have any history, they'll fold their tent and we can say, what can we do? Then they decided they're going to put the bus drivers up, and bus drivers are part of the CCU. And not one member of the Federation had called any of the leadership of the bus drivers to say, oh, by the way, you're going out and strike on Tuesday. So we met with Art in the basement of the um, Burnaby Winter Club prior to a meeting where Solidarity was actually formerly put life into it. And we said, we do not agree with the process by which you've assigned the bus drivers to go out with no consultation but we agree with the outcome. So we were, Colin Kelly, myself, and Jerry Krantz were in the ICTU offices on the Friday before the Kelowna Accord, completely unaware that this was taking place. The discussions had all been going on. We'll have a general strike and we'll say to the provincial government, you want the province back to work? Call an election. We'll go back to work the day after you drop the writ. And we'll see what happens. And we get a call, and Bill Clark from the tele telecommunication workers, because they had good relationships with us, phoned up and said, we want you to call off the, the strike. And so Colin and Jerry and I talked, and we said, and keep this in mind, um, the election had happened in May. Dave Barrett had lost against Bill Bennett for the second time. He resigned that month as leader. We were now six months into the Bill Bennett government. This stuff came down. We sat back and said, what's the worst possible scenario? Four and a half years of this government? When there was only, th uh, if three seats had gone the other way, it would have been a Dave Barrett government. There was only four and a half percent difference in the popular vote in the May election. And we thought, my God, the entire province is behind this process. We're prepared to risk an election because we think we can get elected. But Bill Clark was there to tell us we, the Federation doesn't think that the NDP can win the election. So we know that the discussion was going on that an election was possible. Okay, I'm going to wrap, and I'm gonna wrap, up wrap right things here. up because yeah. I want the panel to be and, have and a so chance the, to respond. The key thing is... I echo the, the comments about you need the process, but we were on the verge of top, the first jurisdiction in North America to bring down a government by popular protest. Okay, I just wanted to sort of take a pause in the comments and see whether anybody would like to respond or has any thoughts. So maybe we'll start at this end with Cliff and just work our way down. It's not necessarily responding, uh, although I could. Uh, it's about just a few additional comments prompted by what people are saying here. One of the interesting things that Ken talked about, people in other unions and the coalition showing up picketing, all the work. Well, that, by the way, took all of our pickets away from government buildings. So teachers were coordinated to come to our buildings and they picketed off government workers. You know, so we, we still had picket lines. It was you know, cross picketing. It was an incredible thing. It just happened over a couple of days. Uh, I know because my, my, my late wife uh, was one of those chief uh, uh, picket line organizers for the Lower Mainland. And she was up every morning getting a hold of teachers, sending our people someplace. It was an incredible, incredible experience. There was another positive about the strike and the fight back. It slowed down and, and if not eliminated for a while, what would happen in other provinces. I, I'm, in part of, I'm part of the National Union of Public and General Employees, representing provincial government employees across the province. Each and every one of them said, there are people from inside, the government had told them, if BC government had 
been able to go through with that, it was going to sweep the country. We in BC were able to stop that, to modify it. I mean, restraint programs came in, I mean, but none of that vicious brutality attacking all the fundamental rights of the labor movement and human rights and civil rights. So it was of an important victory in that way. Rod's question is a good one. I think some of us were prepared to go. I know in our union, we were prepared to go. I think the teachers were still prepared to go, to keep it going. The transit workers were. I mean, when I'm talking about the broad scale transit, the ferries. And the issue is they couldn't fucking jail us all. You know, we're talking about a few hundred thousand workers out there. The government's going to do what? Bring an injunction against every one of us? You know, the RCMP and the police, they weren't going to do anything. We had it. All we needed was this, some will. But we also needed people to actually take seriously the issue of a coalition partnership and building to, and putting together a, an agreeable package, sitting down, you know, the different unions, private sector, public sector, coalition, uh, later, and figure out what is the package. Margaret talked about the, the coal in the, in the communities. It ain't, I mean, it would be difficult, but we could have put together something. And uh, I forget who mentioned the fact, but going ahead anyway. Um, August the 15th, the Empire Stadium rally. That was planned and organized, and we, we rented. The BCG, we rented Empire Stadium before the Fed had approved it because we weren't sure the Fed would approve it. You're talking about the rallies being, uh, the leaflets being just handed out. Jeff, Jeff. Jeff, yeah, Jeff. When you hand but the leaflets, we didn't think they were going to fall. We said the only way to get these guys to come on to this August 15th rally is we'll book the stadium anyway and announce that it's been booked, which we did. And you saw what happened. The stadium was full. So I think that's, we, we lost a lot. That's I it. don't have very much to say in relation to uh, what happened, but I really believe we need to, to uh, look around and, and recognize that some of those issues that we, uh, we stood out for and we marched against are still with us in terms of poverty, in terms of homelessness, in terms of addiction, uh, all kinds of issues. And so I don't think we should simply think in terms of what we did 35 years ago, but what we need to do today as a united front. And, and as I mentioned in my, my remarks, that there is a, more of an opportunity for us to come together because I think there is more of, a, 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 more of an environment in which there is agreement that, uh, that together we can achieve those things. And so, it seems to me, I'm sorry that I have a, a terrible cold and I'm not able to concentrate very much, but mm -hmm. I really want you to know that I'm still hopeful, in spite of the bitterness that I still feel about Kelowna Accord, I can start crying just like we all did that day. Uh, but, uh, but I really want to think in terms of how do we go forward? What should we be doing today in relation to those issues that we stood for? So it seems to me that we have a long work to do, and I think there is enough strength and, and commitment and social responsibility among all of us, whether we belong to a community organization or whether we belong to a union, we should be able to work together. Thank you. I just want to make a couple of remarks. But first, I wanted to just remind people that when we, we talk about this uh, exciting uh, happening where we uh, phoned all these unions members and, and uh, coalition members and got them out, you know, these were landlines we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have email, you know? I mean, it was, a, it was a different time. But it worked then. What were they called? Phone trees? They were called phone trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the two points I want to make are, are this. There, there's a misconception out there, and I saw it in, in, when I read the Wheeling, uh, the Solidarity Express in, in Jack Monroe's uh, autobiography, a misconception that somehow 
Other people than union members were making decisions about us going on strike. GU members made that decision to go on strike. BCTF members made that decision. Nobody else made that decision for us. We made that decision as members that we're going to go out on strike. It's a misconception to say that somebody was making decisions for us to do this or to do that. It was an Operation Solidarity Action Plan, not a Solidarity Coalition Action Plan that had these strikes. And what was Operation Solidarity? It was the unions, all of the unions deciding on this action plan. So I just wanted to deal with that misconception that seems to be out there that someone was deciding for us. But the other thing I wanted to say was this thing of, I don't think the choice on the 13th was a deal or a general strike. I don't think that was the choice. I think the deal, the choice was a deal or more pressure for a better deal. Yes. You know, that was the choice. And that's where I think the error was made because I think that, that as I said, we sent somebody who, who really wanted to deal badly and he represented a, a large group of the private sectors in the in union movement that, that felt that way. But the rest of us didn't. And, and so to put more pressure on, take the transport workers out. Let's, let's, let's put the heat on a little more so that Bennett wanted a deal as much as we did because he saw our weakness and he exploited it. So I, I think that was the other point I wanted to make. I mean, there, there was no general strike on the horizon. <coughs> we didn't even have the hospital workers coming out until the end of November. And then that's just the public sector. Mm -hmm. So if there was a general strike, it was far off in the future if, if it was going to happen. So I think that we... We just uh, misread it and screwed up. Yeah, we could have slowed it down. Yes. If you wanted to talk, sure. we could have slowed it. Like in any strike. Yeah. You know, rotating picket lines or whatever. Like, oh, yeah, it's just, but it's still <laughs> it's <laughs> it. Margaret and Ross. Those, obviously, those with um, kind of the market economy or kind of libertarian views would, would have us want to define ourselves as... Um, as consumers and not as citizens. And so it's, I, I really think it's just up to us to uh, keep making that stand that we are citizens. Uh, Matthew Bolton with uh, London Citizens, our alliance in London, England, uh, just this year wrote a book called uh, How to Resist from Protest to Power. And um, it, you know, it's that, it is that, I really think it's that decision that, um, uh, that we have to keep making in terms of how we, whatever happens in structures that might seem to impede or you know be a real block for a time um, that as citizens we just have to choose to not let those um, those impede us uh, okay a couple of things first of all Jack Monroe the elephant in the room uh, God forbid that I would defend Jack whose uh, comments about the solidarity coalition were, were quite reprehensible and uh, really quite terrible but on the Kelowna Accord itself, Jack bore all the vitriol himself. He wasn't alone in that decision. Right. They all wanted out of it. He was phoning back to Burnaby to the officers of the Federation saying, you know, this is this and this is happening. And finally, he didn't make that decision on his own. We all know what his, where his heart, he wanted out of it. There's no question about that. But they all wanted, most of them, not all. Most of them wanted out of it, and Jack was in touch with them. So when the decision was made to stumble out onto the porch and basically give these pathetic, vague, uh, whatever they were, <laughs> they were, vagueness, that called the strike off, uh, it wasn't just Jack Monroe. Yep. And let's remember, too, before the teachers went out, this incredible four-month, unprecedented mass protest movement that was heading towards a general strike would have been called off just by a very s small agreement to give the North Vancouver teachers an exemption from Bill 3. That's all it would have taken. And uh, Art was very proud of that. I'm not saying that's critically. That was the position. Larry Keene, I believe, too, also supported that, so that the t you, could, you could negotiate exemptions from Bill 3 and its seniority would apply and people couldn't be fired without cause. They had that agreement. At the last minute, the government, sensing weakness again, killed that exemption. And that prompted Art Cuby to announce a few hours later, very dis he was very disheartened that the 
general strike was going ahead, the plan of action was going ahead. So when you think about the social issues being forgotten about as things proceeded or you know, being sold out, that would have stopped the general strike, that one single exemption to Bill 3 in North Vancouver. Now, that didn't get a lot of publicity because you know, the events that followed were so dramatic. But that was also, Art QB, and I don't say, again, I don't say this critically at all, he took the position you can't negotiate social issues. That's not for unions to negotiate because at a certain point, what's enough? When do you decide, oh, we've got enough? You know, that was never clear. And I just, in my good old clipping file, I found an interview with, I did with Art in February of 1984. And he just reiterates, I always took the position that you can't negotiate those issues. The mistake we made is that we said that we did negotiate those things with the government. That's what got us into trouble with the coalition. That's where the thing became undone. So again, there were more players involved than just Jack Monroe. Okay, I think we've got time for one more round of comments. I've got Maybe Diane, three or four. I've got Bill and the gentleman up there, okay? Okay. Thanks, thanks, yes. Um, well, like many of you in the room, I was probably a, a young uh, trade union activist and just sort of learning a lot at the time, uh, but also in a a leadership position and locked in the hemlock room at the Labor Relations Board for three weeks negotiating while this was going on. But I think the lead up to all of that was a forever changing thing in, all, in so many of our lives because I can say for myself, I was still learning so much about the labor movement, but I wasn't learning uh, very much about working with community partners. And what this really got us into doing, and I do remember some comments when we talked about a coalition and our um, first vice president at the time was tasked with working, uh, John Shields, to go to Victoria and to work with some of these leaders, um, whether it be in faith movements or other community partners, to bring them together. And many of the people who were union leaders at the time voted him the least likely to succeed in what we called that mission. But succeed we did, working together. And I had the privilege of traveling the province with many of those community leaders and partners. And what I learned in that, I would never have learned in a lifetime. I learned it in a very short period of time. It stuck with me. It stuck with many people that are in this room that work with coalitions. Some of us are retired now, and we work with coalitions because we know coalitions work. And so we've spent a lot of time here tonight talking about what we think failed or whatever. I am always accused of being this eternal optimist. But I can tell you, my life was forever changed. It changed. It was changed by this locked chain of coalition work that was held together in my heart and my soul. And I have never, ever forgotten that. And when things get really crazy and people are chasing their tails, um, I always remember another very important person in our leadership life and saying to us, you have to believe change is possible, but you have to work for change. And many of us went to the CLC school and we learned uh, always got the inheritance, you know. Every generation has to do it all again. You gotta work for it, you gotta fight for it. And for us that were involved in that, young people, young activists, whether we were just learning to be leaders or not, 
We formed those partnerships and they have never changed, they have strengthened. I know when I sit now and I look at a Federation of Labor Executive Council report going to this convention, there's a whole listing of community partners working in coalitions, submitting and working with those coalitions, whether it's poverty reduction, whether it's child care coalition, BC Health Coalition, whatever it is, housing, you name it. Those unions are committed to working with those coalitions because those issues are our issues, our members' issues, our, our families' issues. We can't separate that. We know it. So I think it's important to bring that in as life learned lessons. I traveled across the country talking about what happened in British Columbia after 1983 to share the experiences. And I know, as Cliff said, in those provinces and those unions, they wanted to hear from us. They wanted to learn so they could, they could fight it back. We were a laboratory in British Columbia. We were the Petri dish. They were studying us. We had, what we did was we did win so much. And yes, we didn't win at all. Oh. But God, let's not, let's not cut ourselves short on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'm glad to hear uh, so many people that have such good memories about what went on. I have a hard time with what happened last week. <laughs> but you know, I think starting with what Rod's comments on Jack Monroe, and Jack's not here to defend himself, so I'm not going to say too much other than the fact that he was the messenger on this and that there were people behind it in the Federation who uh, caved in, who were prepared to throw the coalition people under the bus. But it goes a little further than that, and it's been mentioned by some of the uh, previous speakers. You know, it wasn't just about, in my opinion, it wasn't just about the people in labor or the people in the coal coalition. It was about the people of this province, and that's where we lost out. We didn't have the faith, or at least the people that were leading the, the, the Federation didn't have the bloody courage to listen to the membership out there. And I had the opportunity as the president of the Carpenters Union to talk to the membership on a regular basis from job to job and at a couple of comfort, a couple of meetings that were held in the West Kootenai, I shared the podium with uh, Father Roberts and again in Rupert. There were mass turnouts and there was exuberation there. People were, were feeling good. It was, it was a wonderful feeling and it was something to be proud of to take part in. But the rug was pulled out from underneath and you know the point is that it wasn't just Jack Monroe. There was people there, Jack Monroe used my name, that I was in the meeting even, even me. I guess he figured if he could stick a communist in there that that would help to solve <laughs> and ju justify what was going on. But in any case, he used my name in his, in his book and I told him I wanted a public retra retraction. He couldn't remember what he had said or so forth and, and that and never happened. It went in the Pacific Tribune and I'm not sure about Rod, but I think it was in the province. But in any case, something that's not being brought up here, and I completely agree with the comments of Patsy George, it's, it's okay to talk about the past. We know some lessons from that, where you have the kind of uh, input from all the people involved, from the different organizations. You make decisions on the basis of that, not handing it to a corporal's guard at the Fed, ec Fed executive or any, any other organization like that, we need that kind of broad participation. But the thing that is not being mentioned, and it was told to me by someone at the very top, that the NDP MLAs were after the Federation to pull the plug out from under it because they didn't want to end up in an election, and there was word out that even Bennett was talking about an election. Maybe we should have an, an election. So the NDP played a part in that too. They didn't want, as according to what I was told by this authority, who I won't name, but <laughs> the NDP played a role too, and there's ne not, not been any mention of that. Okay, I think we, thank you. We had two more, uh, I, I, I think we probably only have time, Ken, am I right? for? 
two more? Sure, and then, yeah. and then maybe <laughs> sure. final comment. Yeah. Ah, it's on. My name's Tom Sanborn. I'm a retired member of the ATU. I've even been known to commit public journalism. I was in a very small cadet way a labor reporter for 12 years. Um, I look around this room, I see a lot of faces I remember from 35 years ago. And it's heartening to me that so many people have stayed on as lifers in this fight and have come back to try to figure out what the fuck happened to us 35 years ago and, and what the lessons are that we can take forward. First of all, this may be the only time that we'll hear that Jack Monroe invoked a communist to endorse his position. So <laughs> mark that down, right? Um, the other is the old organizer slogan, nothing about us without us. There's a lot of talk and thought here about the power of coalitions and I totally endorse that. I spent my whole life trying to build coalitions and work in coalitions. But it's not a coalition if one group or a small subgroup at the top can shut down the whole operation without consulting and fully democratically hearing the will of the rest of the coalition. That was the fundamental failure that we had 35 years ago. It's not a failure that we're immune to now. So let's remember as we build coalitions and extend the coalition work that they need to be accountable and they need to have a democratic process, particularly from the voices of people who are most affected and least powerful in that coalition. And the last thing that seems to me like a lesson to remember from all of this is the sheer animal pleasure of solidarity. The wonderful experience of being in the streets, thousands of us taking over the streets, surrounding the social credit convention, marching into that, into that, that wonderful place at the PE. That was fun, that was joy, that was an experience of the festival of the people, when we take some power and actually use it. That doesn't mean that it substitutes for careful decision making and negotiating. And as a member of the Co Solidarity Coalition, I certainly thought that our rights were part of what was gonna be negotiated. I certainly thought that what the women's groups were fighting for were gonna be fought for by the entire push. Silly me, I was young and naive. Maybe next time around, and that starts tomorrow, we'll take the voice of women and of people of color and of poor people more seriously, we'll build something more democratic, and maybe we'll have a bit more fun. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, Mervyn Van Steinberg. Uh, I was uh, an unemployed action center coordinator uh, in those years, one of the 32 they had in the province, and uh, Sister Zander is here as well, uh, she was in Vancouver too. And outside the Lower Mainland, we chaired most of the coalitions uh, as the coordinators uh, in those centers. And, and to pick up on what Diane said, uh, a lot of leadership came out of, uh, out of that whole movement and, and the, the exhilaration, all that stuff. But what I really want to say and it's really a criticism of this panel and of this program tonight. Because I was part of the steering committee that put this together. And so I'll accept this criticism myself. The intent was, as I thought, was to inform the next generation about the learnings from this Operation Solidarity and the Solidarity Coalition. Nobody has changed anybody's mind in here tonight as to whether Jack Monroe was a traitor or not. We all believe what we believe now when we walked in the door. I'll tell you where we failed here tonight. The ticket to get in here should have been somebody under 25 with you. The other ticket to get in here this is a whole bunch of us old farts. Good for us. I love you all, actually. I really do. And I learned a lot from you guys. Having a big debate about what did or didn't happen in Operation Solidarity. There's no learning here moving forward, because the other ticket would have been all of these precious community groups that I've heard us talk about tonight. Where are they? Where are they? Might have two in here, maybe. But outside of that, it's a bunch of us as trade unionists talking about what happened there. That's fine, that's good. I also know a whole bunch of other old farts that wouldn't come because they were afraid that's what was gonna happen here. 
So I take that criticism myself, and I think that Art's comments in the end of the video, we didn't do. We haven't done an analysis in a way that we can pass some learning on to the next generation. That's a very nice segue for me because that's what I do every day, is try and teach young people in the classroom about the importance of unions, the history of the labor movement. And what I would say is that for many young people, unions don't figure in their lives. Union density has fallen a lot. Many of them, their experiences of, are of precarious, temporary, low-paid work. Um, those that do encounter unions often, often encounter them in that temporary work, right? Because unionized sectors are not immune from that. Some of those kids in my class are kids who've been out in the streets being arrested in pipeline protests for indigenous rights, for climate change. So we do the, young, the younger generation a huge disservice if we believe that they're not you know, politically engaged. I would say that they would be amazed to hear that all of this happened without cell phones and Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> so I think they do have some things to learn about uh, grassroots face-to-face -face organizing and the importance of, of coalition building um, that, that can't only happen online. But I think the challenge for all of us is to think about those moments of solidarity um, that, that galvanized everybody in this room, how do we carry that forward into the struggles that matter for today's young people and for a more just society? Um, because we very much need that energy right now. And I'll finish on that. Thank you. This campaign